It told me it wasn't no catching up, but just like it wasn't no room in the caddy. I had to lap them up. Now I'm in the gym doing two a days. Push, push, push. Now I'm in the gym doing two a days. Push, push, push. And I'm getting money in any way. All I know is going getting paid. My moving weight like every day. Now I'm in the gym doing two a days. I'm in the gym doing two a days. Push, push, push. I'm in the gym doing two a days. Let's run it up. Guys, I'm Carl Reed with my co-host, Carl Washington. Welcome to the Run Up the Score podcast. Our special guest today is Coach Nick Hill, the head football coach at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. Coach, how are you doing? Yeah, no, I'm excited to be here. Coach, can you give us a little bit about your coaching background, kind of where you've been? Uh, we know you were an excellent player, excellent quarterback down there at Southern Illinois. Can you kind of tell us how you got into coaching? and how you ascended to be the head coach at Carbondale? Yeah, no, I, I um, you know, it's a little bit of a, a different path that I that I traveled to become a, a head coach. Um, you know, I was trying to make it uh, for about five seasons after college of playing professionally, never made it on a final NFL roster. Uh, but really when I got to Orlando and I was playing in the uh, Arena Football League, I started coaching um, high school football. And uh, I coached at Dr. Phillips High School, and then I coached at West Orange High School that are 8A schools there in Orlando. And uh, was thankful and fortunate to be able to, in arena, you play in the summer, but in the fall uh, is your off season. So you can you can be a full-time coach and uh, was able to get in and, and be an offensive coordinator down in Florida. And then in 2013, when my playing career was over, I moved back to Carbondale. Um, I'm from here in Southern Illinois. My wife and I moved back and I was the head high school coach at Carbondale High School in 2013. And then in 2014, there was an opening at uh, at SIU and I became the quarterback coach. 2015, I was the offensive coordinator. And then uh, there was a coaching change uh, that happened in 2015. And uh, they named me the interim head coach and they, they opened it up and interviewed a few guys. And I was fortunate enough to, to get an interview. And um, I'm thankful that in 2016, they, they took a chance on, on me to be the head coach and uh, had a lot to learn. I was 30 years old and um, I'm still learning. And I think that's the, uh, the key is to, the, to always be learning. And I, I know that I have, I've learned a ton, uh, but uh, time flies because I, now I'm 35 years old going into to year five and, uh, but fortunate every day to be able to come to work as the head coach. Coach, when we, um, we try to educate our viewers and our listeners a lot on the different levels of college football, can you kind of, from a scholarship standpoint, explain to everyone, how scholarships are divided up and at the FCS level and what the difference is between FCS and the FBS level when you're talking about scholarships and kind of how you have to fill your roster out? Yeah, without a doubt. I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the biggest uh, responsibilities that I have as the head coach is, is managing, managing our roster just like anybody but the difference as an fcs head coach is you almost have to be a gm of sorts as far as managing a salary cap or a, uh there's so many things that go in, into uh, a partial scholarship so uh to break it down i mean we can have 85 guys on scholarship but we get 63 equivalencies to make up those 85 so however you want to do that you break up your scholarships you just can't go over that allotted 63 scholarships. So um, there's a lot of different ways that you, you can get to that. Um, uh, some guys are on full scholarships. Um, some guys are on some academic, some athletic that get them to a full. Um, so there's, there's all different ways. Now, when you talk about FBS, they can have 85 guys on scholarship, but they're all on full scholarship. So there's no partials involved. So when you get an offer, uh, it's a full scholarship offer. And so uh, there's a lot of different ways, you know, the, the more that I learn, it, it kind of um, you, what school you go to, what, in, what your institutional um, uh, qualifies as different, you know, for us, uh, you know, what qualifies you to get um, academic scholarships, a dean scholarship, a chancellor scholarship. So 
uh, sometimes when you're at your recruiting board, it's not only you, you of course, put a premium on kids that, that have good, good grades, but it also, um, you know, allows you to, to save some money on your equivalencies when you recruit a kid that might have a 25 or 26 on his ACT because you, you don't you don't have to to use as much as of your um, athletic aid. So um, but it, there's a lot of different you see a lot of veteran coaches that know the ins and outs of your equivalencies. And you you can. I think it's a difference between getting an extra one or two good, really good players on your, your roster. Can now, you uh, can you uh, can you talk to us a moment, uh, especially the parents out there, and explain to them the difference between a, a, a partial scholarship and full scholarship, and also do they have programs in place for the kids to help offset the cost of the partial scholarships? Yeah, without a doubt. I, I think that, you know, when you're talking about a, a scholarship or when you're sending your your uh, your son or daughter to go to school to play is uh, you got to think about tuition, fees, books and room and board. And then uh, what it really and now with cost of attendance is that's really, you know, what's it cost to go to school there above and beyond um the money for tuition and fees and books. And so um, that's really what you're looking at. And so when you think of, Hey, tuition is $10,000. There's a lot, really there's for us. I mean, it's about $28,000 for tuition fees, books, room and board. So room and board is, you know, you're staying in the dorms, your meal plan, everything included your fees or everything from, um, you know, maybe you're in each institution are different on fees as well, but that can be four to five thousand dollars a year. And so that's what makes up a full scholarship. And so uh, and then there's all different ways. I mean, your state has different things in place. Um, we have in Illinois what we call the MAP grant. So there's always uh, what money you qualify. We always try to inform our players and our financial aid office to uncover any money that is free money a lot allotted to them through a federal Pell Grant or in our state, some kids qualify for our state MAP grant, but not the Pell uh, um, to get, we're, we're gonna help them do that. So um, that's really what you, what you have to, and our parents need to ask those questions. Um, and we try to do the best job that we can. I think open communication um, on that, um, if you're not going to be on, on a full scholarship. Now, coach, when you are, when you split up scholarships, is there a difference in that you get to use your equivalencies in state versus out of state tuition? Is it better for you to have an Illinois guy, you know, versus a guy from let's say Florida before the scholarship allotment because of the in state versus out of state tuition? I, when I, it's, that's a great question because, um, you know, when I first started as a uh, an assistant, when I was recruiting, my state that I recruited was Florida. But now, since then, we have went as an institution where we don't have out of state tuition. Okay. So every every state, it used to be where you know Missouri, anybody, any state that touched Illinois, um, you know, Indiana and Missouri, for example, you got, got in state tuition. Kentucky got in state tuition. But now every state gets in-state tuition. So it allows um, us to um, really recruit where, wherever. It really has helped us as well as, as recruiting walk-ons. It was hard to get kids to, to pay out-of-state tuition to walk on your team or even ask them to do that. Uh, but now that, they, that, you can, that you get in-state tuition, it's opened us up to some more um, walk-ons as well. Mm -hmm. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about today, and um, Carl and I were actually talking about this before you hopped on here, is quarterback. And you're a former quarterback. You played at a very high level. Um, you're one of the best quarterback evaluators that I have seen. And we've talked extensively about different quarterbacks. You recruited my nephew for a while, David Moore, um, who ended up going to Central Michigan. There are a few kids in the area, guys like Aquil Glass, Caleb Ellerby, 
Uh, we think about Brett Gabbard and, and Mike Glass who playing in the MAC conference. It seems like that's the hardest position to evaluate and get a kid a scholarship at. And that and and the recruiting for that position seems to be a lot more thorough and it's a lot more um, scrutinized than probably every other position. What are some of your thoughts on what quarterbacks must have to be able to play at that level? What are you looking for when you're evaluating a quarterback? And what are some of those decisions that go into deciding the type of guy that you want when you offer a quarterback? Yeah, what a what a uh, you know a, a great question, a tough question. I don't think that we we have the exact science. I mean, you you kind of you look at the NFL, for example, and you know what we don't have in college is that that opportunity. I mean, for for right now, and, and I have some some friends that are um, Zach Taylor, who just took Joe Burrow as a as a good friend of mine. And uh, we went to the Manning Passing Academy back when we were in college in 2006. We were roommates down there. And now he's the head coach of the Bengals. Well, you know, they they do some in, in, in really just dive deep into the who they are as people and fly around and get private interviews and uh, bring them to the hotel room and uh, put them on the board and do all these things. And as college coaches, we're just – you know, not able to do that. For example, I mean, um, you try the best and you get the kid on campus, but you might, you know, you've got to do a great job of finding out what is the makeup of that kid. And, um, you know, you just don't win games in shorts and a t-shirt. And um, you, you want to see, for for me, the, the thing is, is you want to see what did he do in the biggest games. So against the toughest opponents, like I, I don't really care how many yards you pass for. If you look at my high school, I played in a wishbone offense. I played for one of the best high school coaches, but I mean, we were going to hand the ball off. We might get a few play action passes on third down and 10. We were going to throw it, but if they went off stats, I wasn't going to get recruited at all. Now I played basketball and I bounced around and found myself playing quarterback, but I say that to so many kids are, you know, I threw this, these TDs and I threw this many yards, but what, you know, was it against the best team? Was it in a championship game? Was what were you doing on third down on fourth down? Was your high school coach calling your number? And so I, I think that that's what I want to see is I want to see that he play his best in the biggest moments in the biggest games was his high school coach counting on putting the ball in his hands in the toughest moments. And if not, then I don't know if that's the guy that, that we, that we need. And so um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough uh, uh, position to evaluate when you, especially when you only get a couple in-person evaluations. I'm uh, for example, just uh, not using names, but a, a kid that we're recruiting right now. And uh, we were on the phone, had a good conversation. And it's just like, especially in this 2021 class, it's like, I think that your film's really good. Um, you know, I've talked to your high school coach, but I haven't, I've never met you in person. I've never looked you in the eye. I've never shook your hand. Uh, I've never seen you throw in person. And a lot of people can get in trouble by that. They get on campus and then you see that some things that you'd maybe not haven't ever seen, but now you, now you have them. So I think in-person evaluation, you hear that from a lot of coaches uh, but it is important at the quarterback position to see him in person. But more for me is I want to meet him in person and talk to him and see what their makeup is. From an evaluation standpoint, um, or from a preference standpoint, I should say, rather, are you looking for a guy who can really spin it? Do you feel like he's got to be able to run and be a dual threat? Does it matter either way? Do you prefer one? Versus the other, what do you think is the is the most important thing from that particular skill set? Yeah, I think number one is they've they've got to be able to make their teammates around them better. I, I honestly, you know, if I could mold a perfect quarterback, it would be an athletic passer. Uh, but you're gonna have to pick up some first downs by being athletic enough to move in the pocket. That doesn't mean you have to run a four or five forty or run the zone read to perfection. I'm talking about being an athlete. 
you know, when I think of Tom Brady, I think of Peyton Manning. Those guys are those guys are good athletes too. Uh, so they so for me, I want to I want to pick the intangibles first before I say that I'm gonna, you know, put myself in a corner and say this is the only way that we're going to um, recruit a quarterback. The best quarterback that I've that I've coached, um, or it. If Mark Iannotti, when I was the offensive coordinator in 2015, I wouldn't be sitting here today as the head coach if it wasn't for him. He would not impress one person in short. And if he, you know, for example, he came to Lindenwood, Mark Iannotti wouldn't get put in the first group over there as far as throwing. But he was tough as nails. His teammates loved him. He he was humble as can be. I've talked to our quarterbacks a lot uh, just t- here recently is – about being being humble. I think the best RPO quarterbacks out there right now is you got to have a humility to keep handing the football off. Do what's right for the team. When you get what's your mindset when you get that play call in from the sideline and it's an RPO and you got a you got a five step post and you're re, are you hoping that it comes down or are you hoping that you get to give it to the the running back and he goes and has a big big run. And so I think having the humility and and it, even the last dance is watching the the best scores watching lebron pass it and pass it and pass it knowing that there's going to be a time in the game that you're going to have to make a big play for your quarterback not forcing things but having being humble enough to to hoping that your teammates um get get all the glory and that can lead so i think that the toughness and the ability to naturally lead and not being coached up. I think a lot of kids nowadays go to these trainers and things and they're coached up on what to say and they can say the right things, but are you naturally able to lead people and make people around you better? Can uh can you can you tell us for people back home in St. Louis, how can a parent whose son is not on the radar? How, how can they go about getting a son on the radar where a school like SIU would look at them? Well, I think the, the first thing is, um, is, is your film. I mean, obviously, you're, you're going to have to, to, you know, do a great job of where you're at. You can't change that. You have to do a great job of – putting the film out there at the end of the day it doesn't really matter uh what trainer you're going to what camp you're what camp lineups you have or or what you did at so and that's okay i think the best thing that i would tell the parents is what if your son doesn't have the best highlight video that's okay is do everything that you can possibly be doing right now to have the best junior season you can have or senior season be okay with where you're at that you can uh, there are a lot of places that you can play college football you can only go to one school you can only sign to one place and as a parent not getting caught up in the arms race of how how many offers you have and all the social media stuff, but you're going to be successful when they come in and continue to get better. And you got to do that while you're in high school too. So when, when you uh, came out of high school, you went to uh, Western Kentucky to play basketball, right? Right. Then, then you hurt your hand. And so you transferred to uh, SIU. Like what, do you regret not c- continuing playing basketball? I don't, you know, I, it was a tough decision. You know, I played down there and then all, you know, I, I come back and I, I, um, you know, I was on a partial football scholarship. I left a full scholarship and came back home and, um, I came back here because I was going to be able to play both sports. So, you know, one of my favorite years that I played was I set out in 2005 and uh, was on the SIU's basketball team, and we went to the second round of the NCAA tournament. So I got an NCAA tournament ring. I didn't do anything. I didn't score any points, but I was at every practice, and I was at the games, and I learned a ton about winning. I mean, that was when we went to the Sweet 16 the next year. And um, so I, I looking back, you know, I, I've, I've heard this before, is that, you know, you, you can only 
connect the dots looking backwards. And sometimes you're in tough situations in the position you're at, or you feel like you're in a tough time, but those are just strengthening you and shaping your path. And as a person of, of faith, you just have to, to, to keep going, make those decisions. And your path is never going to be the way that you, you think that it's going to go. It's not going to go exactly as planned. And mine, mine have had a lot of lefts and rights and turns along the way. And uh, so looking back, I, I, right now I don't have any regrets. I don't have regrets about, man, I, I got, I got screwed and didn't make a team or got cut in this team or that, you know, when I was in arena football, just to, playing in front of a thousand fans, I was benched twice and, uh, you know, it's tough and this and that, but that that's what makes you who you are is all of the ups and downs. And so I'm thankful for every situation I've been in. Offensively coach, where, where is kind of your philosophy? What, it, what, it, where's your identity come from? You're known as an offensive guy, obviously being a quarterback, who are some of the people that have shaped um, your philosophy offensively? Well, I think that, um, you know, the, the coach kill is who I, you know, I played under. And so yeah, all four years. And so we were, we were a pro style offense. So when you say that, you know, what, what are you as an offensive guy? I think that I'm a, you know, a, a pro style spread offense. I mean, we're still going to have the, the philosophies of running the football uh, and and having, I mean, I, whenever I think of whenever it's like you're just a spread offense. I mean, if you watch us play, um, there's times that we got three tight ends and a fullback out there and one, one wide receiver. Or if you're going to come play in our offense, you're going to be um, – you're going to be put – in a lot of different formations, a lot of different uh, – we want athletes that can make plays. So this year we had two different guys that rushed for 1,000 yards. We used the Wildcat in a lot of different ways. We had a freshman All-American that rushed for 1,000 yards out of basically out of the Wildcat. Um, a lot of guys touch the football and catch passes with that screens and reverses. So um, – you know, but the fundamental things don't change in doing that. And so when I think when you look at the pro football, uh, you see a lot of that um, with, you know, Sean McVay and the 49ers and and even the, the Chiefs. I mean, the fundamental things is you're going to have to be able to run the football and play action pass. Um, what you don't see is a lot of those teams where you just you're not just going to drop back pass all the time. There's a lot of dudes over there on defense that can make your your world pretty, pretty tough. And so, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to hang our hat on being a physical physicality, I think is never going to change in this game, no matter how they're going to change it for the good or the safety, there's still going to be a time and place where, where you, the teams that win are going to be physical. So I think coach kill always instill, you know, instilled that in, in me, my time in pro football of seeing that. And then, uh, um, just my different times of watching and learning. I never was, you know, the one thing you ask about, not not a regret, but something that if I could go back and, you know, wish something is that I could go back and GA and learn up under someone with that. Really my first high school coaching job, a coach told me, you're the offensive coordinator calling the plays. I call the defense. Here you go. So, that's not always a great thing either. I, I was able to learn that and, and call plays from my first job, but I wasn't able to, to do that where I'm in a staff room and I'm just the low man on the totem pole and I'm learning and I'm gaining all that stuff. I've had to do it a lot by trial and error. Now, Coach, you being a former high school coach um, and transitioning into college, what were, what are some of the philosophies – you felt like as both a high school and a college coach that are important for your program. What are some of the fundamental philosophies that you have for your football programs? Well, I don't think that, it, you know, anything it, that, that changes, no matter if you're in, in high school, if you're in college, I, I don't think it really changes when you go to, um, you know, pro football you've got to, you've got to clearly clarify and implement a culture. 
uh, no matter no matter what in a youth program it is is that you got to say you know what collectively you have to say what 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 do we hang our hat on what do we we want to be known for and we got to identify that and then we have to go out there and live that and so I think that um, I learned that as a, a, in in high school is that uh, it's about the people, it's about relationships, it's about I don't care what you know, and we've all heard this, but some people can do it and some people can't. Is that that relationships build over time, and when they they can trust you, then they'll listen to you and they'll really play for you, and that's what all we're looking at. It doesn't matter what level, it's about. Um, the fundamental things win, you know, the game doesn't change whatever level you're on. It's about blocking. It's about tackling. It's about physically, you know, being persistent and overcoming and being able to adapt. I think adaptability is something that I've put into recruiting is like, tell me something you've adapted to. I mean, even right now, the guys that are going to thrive in this, we're all adapting, but what is something in your life you've had to overcome? Because something in this, these next four years isn't going to go as planned. How are you going to respond to that? How are you going to respond in the middle of the game or how are you going to respond in the off season? If something goes, doesn't go your way, you know, I want to know, and that doesn't change if you're in high school or if you're in college or in your pro sports, I've heard those same things come from the best coaches I've been around. So coach, by me being a high school coach, when we talk about recruiting, Every kid on my team wants to play at the biggest school possible. Like they, their dream is to play in the SEC or the Big Ten and, and things like that. They all want to go to the NFL. Recently in this past draft, you had a guy, Jeremy Chin, who got drafted in the second round by Carolina. And there's always a saying every draft that comes around that they'll find you if you're good enough to play in the NFL. Kind of give me a, a background on Jeremy Chen. How does a guy end up at SIU Carbondale but that's good enough to go in the second round of the draft? And also for you being his coach, what was kind of the process for you in dealing with scouts and personnel departments on helping him um, get to that level and season that moment? Yeah, well, first, Jeremy, um, you know, Jeremy was, one, was the uh, – was on the first recruiting weekend that I was the head coach. And so Mark, coach Rogers, who, you know, well came from, from North Dakota, Jeremy was committed to North Dakota. Uh, while I was the interim head coach, he was the number one guy on our board. And I said, you know, um, you got to at least give us a visit. And um, Marty was the first guy that I hired. He was a teammate of mine. I love Marty like a brother. And so I told him that he that that, that extended his contract lifetime contract because we got <laughs> Jeremy Chin to commit. And right. so he, uh, but no, looking back, I mean, um, you know, Jeremy, of course, he's not in the NFL. He's got the 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 size. I mean, Jeremy looks as good as any football player you're gonna gonna see. And uh, but he developed and he had the mindset to continue to get better. He was a freshman All-American, and he wanted to get better. He wasn't ever satisfied with just being the best player on SIU's football team. He was driven. He was hungry. I'll give you a quick story about J Jeremy. Is is I always meet with every single player at the end of, you know, twice a year, really, uh, you know, just as far as goals. And so after the season, after spring ball, and he went into his last summer and his goals were so specific. I'm talking about how many hours a night he wanted to get of his sleep, what his diet was going to be. Whenever I'm, I, I'm an early riser. So I love to, I love to get to the office early and I'm going to get out of there in the evening time. I got young girls and I want to go spend time with my family and multiple times every in the summertime, he would be, he would beat me there. And so he wanted to make sure he got in the, the hot tub before he worked out, the cold tub. I'm talking about little specific things. And so in a time and place, I kind of wrote about this before the draft, and I shared this with all my uh, – with all the scouts, is that in a time where – I got to get my phone plugged in here. But in a time that the, the, the culture is about 
transferring or, you know, thinking about yourself is that Jeremy, uh, you know, he, we got, he got hurt against Arkansas state. So in the first half, it was a, it was a tough game and we had a chance to win and Jeremy, uh, hurt his foot. And so we went into a bye week after that, we lost our first two games of the, um, the conference season. We went to South Dakota state, had the lead at halftime, ended up getting beat. Illinois state came here. They were a top five team. It was a tough game, ended up losing. So we're 0-2 or 2-4. and four. And Jeremy is is holding this burden of, I can tell by the way he's walking in the building, that he's letting us down, he's letting his teammates down. Some people are like, maybe he's, uh, you know, is he, not, is he not rushing back because he sees all the scouts and things like that here. And, you know, thinking about, I don't want to get hurt for my future. And I knew that wasn't the case, but I called him in. I was like, look, if you don't play another down of Saluki football, you're not letting anybody down. I mean, you you have done more for me personally, the school. You're a 3.5 GPA. You handle yourself with class. You're letting no one down. You don't have to play another down. Like, stop, don't walk in this building and think that you're letting anyone down if you don't play. But he – he on the sideline, I could tell he, he loved to practice and all of a sudden he's pushing himself back in. He's pushing himself back in and we came in Youngstown I and mean, we had to win. If we had a shot at, at our season and we ended up rattling five games off in the Missouri Valley, which is tough to do. And um, Jeremy played his best football with a banged up foot. He was tough, but it was in a time that he could have said, no, nah, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I'm as healthy as I can be for the combine and stuff. I think he loved his teammates so much that he went and willed himself to his best games. And that's what makes up Jeremy Chin. I mean, and that's the story that I shared with scouts. And I think that that's what Matt rules getting with the Carolina Panthers. Now, do you think from a scouting standpoint, being at an FCS school, do you get a good number of NFL scouts through there? Do you feel like that's a true statement when people say if you can really play, they'll find you? Do you get the NFL guys coming through there consistently? We had we had all 32 teams here. Now we had Jer- we had Jeremy, but even in, in another year, I mean, we're going to have 20 plus teams every single season. You know, we we have four active players in the NFL this past season. Uh, we had two DBs. Madre Harper signed right after the draft with, with the Oakland Raiders. So we had two DBs. Now we have four DBs since we took over the job in 2016. Craig James from Edwardsville is on the, the new uh, Philadelphia Eagles, started out with, with the Vikings. Ryan Neal is a kid that played for us uh, that started the game at corner for the Seattle Seahawks against uh, Green Bay in the playoffs. And now we've got Jeremy and Madre, so four DBs since 2016 that are in the NFL. Um, and then we got Michael Pruitt that's a tight end that's active with the uh, Tennessee Titans. So I think when you look at the Missouri Valley, and look, there are competition, but there's great there's great players all over our league. Carson Wentz went number one. I mean, when you're, when you're watching the draft and you want to talk about the hardest position to get drafted, it's quarterback. And mm-hmm. Carson Wentz could have been – the number one pick and went number two. And now, you know, they've got another one up there and you ask Mel Kuyper, who's the the guy next year. And so they're projecting, you know, their quarterback now to be in the first round. David Johnson went in the second round, Jeremy Chin in the second round. Um, You know, the, the tight end from South Dakota state went in the second round, the D end since in 2016 from Youngstown, got drafted in the second round by Bill Belichick. That was their first overall pick in the whole draft. And Bill Belichick comes to the Missouri Valley to, to draft a defensive player. And so uh, it, there, there's tons of talent over this league, and um, especially in the Missouri Valley. I think the respect that the Valley has, there's going to be pros on, on every team and people that get an opportunity. I do think that um, – you know, it's easy for us to say that, but yes, I do believe that they will find you. Sometimes you have to keep working. You're going to have to be able to get told no 
a lot of times, you know, if, if you really want to make it, um, they're done there. I've been there. I've lived that life. That's what I tell our guys all the time. Whenever you want to hear about, you know, I moved to McAllen, Texas and made $200 a week. If you win, you get $50 bonus. And I lived on the, the Mexico border and, uh, I loved every second of it, man. I had a blast playing for the McAllen Desperados and, we would take sleeper buses and do all of that. And so you got to have that in you. Two years later, I signed with the Packers. If I would have never went and paid for 200 bucks, I would have never played for Green Bay. And so you got to you gotta love the game and you got to love the process if you want to make it in pro football. Can I, uh, if the coronavirus thing is over, do you have any camps coming up for high school kids to attend? Well, I don't think that we're going to have any camps this summer. Uh, I did, you know, I, there are, there's a lot of, uh, I'm an optimistic guy. And I think that there's a lot of really, um, you know, encouraging news out there. You saw the stuff with the, the division two um, came out. So we're, we're hopeful that we're going to be able to get out and evaluate um, even this summer. But as of right now in Illinois, we're not able to, uh, to do that. Um, but we will put together if, – if we're allowed to, then we'll have some and, and we'll put that out on social media um, as soon as we know. Are those, will the camps be free to attend? The camps are not the, – the camps are not free. Um, we usually – just like any, um, you know, one-day camp, I think our, our camps last year were $30 to attend the one-day camps. Okay. All right. So, Coach, one of the last things I want to ask you before we get off is if you're a high school football player, you're a high school football parent, and SIU Carbondale calls you to recruit you, why should they choose the Salukis? Well, I think what I can what I can tell a parent is that what you're going to get from, from us as a coaching staff and what your, 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 how your son is going to get treated as a person. And I think that I tell them all that if you're going to go and, and sit down, any head coach is going to tell you the same things. And I think there's a lot of great coaches out there that, that mean that, but I, I, I bleed Mar Saluki Maroon. I mean, I'm from here. I played here. My brother played here. Uh, my wife played here, played volleyball here. Um, I grew up here. It, my, my parents still live here. It, it's, this is home to me. This isn't just another, you know, job that it's a step in the road. I mean, this is, this is where I love. And, um, so this program means everything to me and the, how the, how kids represent themselves out in the community really is a reflection and means the most to me because I mean, you might be going into Walmart and see my grandma. And so I, I want them to wear um, that, that uniform or wear that, that gear with pride. I think that no matter what, I can't promise you how many wins and losses. I feel like we're on the right track to come, go and win championships and build in the right way. But you as a person, you're going to get treated with respect you're going to get treated with, with kindness and love. We're going to push you, uh, but we're going to, and hold you accountable. Uh, but we're going to care about you as people. And so if that, that sounds like, you know, what you want to uh, do and get a great education from a great institution that I got my degree in, and I love this place. It's a beautiful place too. I, I think that what a lot of people don't know is that when you come down to Southern Illinois, you know, you just say Southern Illinois and you, you ultimately you guys don't because you guys are from around here. But I think Illinois, you think of Chicago, but it's a totally different place down here. It's beautiful. Uh, it's a great place to live, raise a family. And uh, so I'm proud of this place. And I think it's an unbelievable place, not just us, but I'm talking about everybody in our building. Um, it's just a tight knit community. And uh, it's an awesome place to go to school. Thank you, Coach. We appreciate you coming on today. Um, obviously, we'll continue to stay in touch. And uh, we enjoyed having you. Thank I appreciate you so it, guys. I was excited to get on. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, Coach. a lot. All right. All right.